Hi, my name is Matt Fleming and I'm the VP of Marketing for Newtonian. Today we will be using Eureka machine learning and data provided by Kaggle.com to predict future financial delinquency using credit scoring characteristics. So that being said, let's get started. First, we can go ahead and open up the Kaggle.com competition page. So this competition, uh, we're essentially going to be trying to predict future financial delinquency by using characteristics or data uh, that's typically used in credit scoring algorithms. So just to back up for a second, this data was provided to Kaggle uh, about a year ago for a competition just to uh, actually do this type of prediction or build this type of model. So we're going to be using that data in this real world problem uh, to demonstra demonstrate what you can actually do with Eureka. Let's take a look at the data. Uh, you can get there via the left hand menu. The data itself is in two files. Um, I've actually downloaded them already and taken a look. It's relatively straightforward. So we have our training data, uh, which isn't split up amongst multiple files. We don't have to do any joins or anything like that. We have our test data. We have the data dictionary. Um, honestly, the column labels are actually pretty self-explanatory, although feel free to download this if you want to you know, get a little bit more detail. Sample entry, you don't need to download that. Uh, the purpose of that is if we were to submit our uh, test or validation data, our submission entry to um, Kaggle. So go ahead and download that data, and then we can go in it, go ahead and open it up in Eureka. Okay, so to get started, we'll need to import the data into Eureka. You can do that by going to File, Import Data, and then selecting the Training Set CSV. Taking a look at the data, uh, we can see on the first column, it's serious delinquencies over two years. This is going to be our target variable. This is going to be what we're going to try to predict. The next one is uh, result, revolving utilization of unsecured lines. We have the applicant's age. We have the number of times they were late, uh, or 30 to 59 days late on a payment, uh, their debt ratio, monthly income, number of open credit lines. This is uh, a similar field to the one that's highlighted. Basically, the number of times they were 90 days late, the number of real estate loans that they have, the number of times they were 90 days or more late, uh, and the number of dependents that they actually have. So we're going to be using all of this because we don't know what's important yet. Eureka will go ahead and identify what variables are actually important for us. If we go over to the Prepare Data tab, uh, we're actually not going to do uh, any advanced preparation of the data. Uh, we're just going to try working with the raw data or the raw training data for now. Um, the way we typically approach problems like these is we'll go through it once, just looking at the raw data. We'll build the model and then we'll try and improve on that model by uh, more thoroughly preparing the data using stuff like removing outliers, smoothing, um, normalization, all that type of stuff. So you have a few different options to handle that. Um, we do have a few other tutorials online to walk you through that, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it for this tutorial. Let's jump over to the set target. Uh, uh, tab. So this is where uh, you essentially direct Eureka or point Eureka in the direction of where you want it to search. If you look at the target expression, what we're saying is model serious delinquencies within two years, which again was column A, it was one of our variables, as a logistic function of all this other or all of these other variables. Uh, again, Eureka may say hey, all of these variables are worthwhile and are to be included in a model, but it may actually come back and say, hey, there's only really two important variables here and this is what the relationship is. So this is where we tell Eureka what to search for and how to search for it. Um, the building blocks are actually another way of telling Eureka uh, how to search for a model. So it's essentially saying, what mathematical building blocks do you want Eureka to play with uh, to build a model that will fit uh, your data? For the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to make some changes. First, if you look back at the data, it's not really in a time series, it's not engineering data, uh, and it doesn't seem like cyclical or seasonal in nature. So what that means is we really don't need the sine and cosine uh, building blocks. I've already gone ahead and uh, disabled them, but they're typically enabled by default, so you may want to double check and just make sure they're disabled. And then we're also going to uh, enable the logistic function. I've also gone ahead and included uh, some of the logical building blocks. We'll see if these actually um, uh, are used in the modeling. Typically, uh, we try not to use anything that's uh, any building blocks that are complex for the first time we work with raw data. But in this case, we'll we'll just see what comes back. 
For the error metric, we're going to use absolute error. We have a few different options, uh, everything from R squared goodness of fit to AIC. Um, so you have a couple options to play with there, but we'll just use absolute error uh, for now. You may see this row weighting. So let's jump back to that data for a second. If you look at the variable we're trying to model, uh, it's actually, there are very few positive occurrences within the data set. So uh, I've gone ahead and looked up at what the actual ratio is. So there's about 10,000 positive occurrences out of 150,000 records. That's relatively sparse. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've enabled row weighting on that variable, which weights it relative to the number of times it occurs in the data set. Now that we've set our target expression, picked out how we want to build models or we, how, how we want Eureka to build models, we've set our error metrics and we've turned on row weighting, we're all set to start searching. Let's go ahead and start the search by going to the Start Search tab and clicking Run. Okay, you may have noticed I went ahead and opened up a completed Eureka project just so we wouldn't have to sit through uh, the amount of time while it's modeling. This will also give us the ability to talk through some meaningful results. Let's take a second just to talk through um, the different aspects of this window and what they mean. On the left, it's essentially detailing the progress and performance of the search to date. We ran this search for four hours, or actually roughly five, on a 72 core private cloud. Now you have a couple options in terms of where you run Eureka or where those computational resources come from. You can run Eureka just on your local uh, desktop or laptop machine. That's typically going to have eight cores or less. You can run Eureka on Amazon EC2. You may have noticed this secure cloud tab in the right hand corner of the screen. What that gives you the ability to do is boot up up to 200 cores on demand for your specific search. And that will also use your local machine as well. Lastly, you have the ability to set up a private Eureka cloud. What that means is that you can go and download the Eureka dedicated server, you can install it on the server, and then you can, then you can connect all of your Eureka desktop machines to that server. That gives you the ability to leverage the ser your internal server's computational resources. Now that we've kind of talked through that, let's jump down to performance. You can see that we went through roughly 350,000 generations, and the stability and confidence or the stability and maturity metrics, those are really trying to give you an indication of, hey, is this a good time for me to stop my search? Um, on the right-hand side, this graph, again, is basically telling you, uh, or it's giving you a visual way of uh, explaining the same exact statistics. So this is telling us the progress of the search over time. You can see that error drops as Eureka creates more accurate solutions, and that's reflected on uh, the scale because it's time versus error. At Newtonian, we tend to look at the big drops um, in mean absolute error as kind of signifying that Eureka is latched onto a moment of truth or some truth within the data. So for us, what we find interesting are these points right here, 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 uh, here as well. And then I think this would probably be one of the last ones we'd really want to look at potentially here as well, because you can see that as um, time goes on, the accuracy of the solution is somewhat plateaued. Now, if we were running this for an hour, I might say, okay, well, we should probably run the search for a longer period of time before concluding that it's plateaued. However, we ran this on a 72 core machine for five hours. So it's likely that this is a pretty good solution. Um, so for us, what we want to do is we want to select the most accurate yet least complex solution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we jump to the view results tab. Down here, project log sounds exactly as it uh, is meant. Uh, it's essentially giving you a log file of all the solutions that Eureka has come up with as it creates them, uh, as well as any statistics that have to do with, uh, for instance, if you had Eureka connected to a private cloud or uh, Amazon EC2. Now that we've talked through this tab, we can go ahead and go to the view results tab and we'll talk through the different solutions and what they actually mean. Okay, so I've gone ahead and jumped over to the view results tab. We'll take a sec to talk through the, the different aspects of this window, and then we'll also talk a little bit about the solutions that Eureka generated. So what we could see starting on the left are the number of solutions or the solutions that Eureka found uh, that it thought were interesting and should be presented to you. 
So it starts off with solutions that are extremely simple yet not accurate, uh, and then goes all the way up to solutions that are extremely accurate, uh, but also very complex. Eureka sorts these solutions by default using a ratio of complexity versus accuracy, although you have the ability to sort uh, you know, strictly based on the complexity or uh, the fit of, the, of a given solution. On the right hand side, you can see this chart right here. What this chart essentially does is it's gonna be graphing um, uh, the solution fit. In this case, because we're predicting literally a zero or a one, uh, there's not as much value in this specific graph. Uh, you'll also note that there's a lot of ones. What that means is that, uh, or that's actually indicative of us turning on row weighting. Um, so we're weighting the ones much more heavily than uh, uh, the zeros. In the bottom left, so if we select a solution up here, it's going to show us the error metrics. Um, and uh, as well as the correlation and complexity of the solution. So we can see the R squared goodness of fit, the correlation coefficient, the mean absolute error, the number of coefficients, the overall complexity. Um, so basically this is kind of like your summary statistics right down here in the bottom left. On the right hand side is a Pareto front. This is extremely helpful for just getting a summary kind of snapshot of solution complexity versus accuracy. So each blue dot here represents a solution and then error, um, basically at, it's error versus complexity. So at Newtonian, as I mentioned uh, in the last, uh, or when we were looking at the last tab, we tend to look at areas where there's a big sharp drop. So for us, the areas that are interesting are here, 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 and here. If you look at the bottom four solutions, this one is infinitely more complex. It, it doesn't really represent any uh, sizable improvement in accuracy. So for us, uh, unless we needed you know, the absolute uh, uh, most precise solution available, we'd probably wanna look at uh, this solution right here as a potential alternative. The reason for that is this solution is actually only 0.2% uh, less accurate than uh, this one, yet it uses nearly 50% less terms. So that's why we'd probably want to look at a solution like this if we were to say, okay, well, what's, what solution represents the best fit of complexity versus accuracy? Let's actually go ahead and take a look at uh, the variables that Eureka thought were important. We can see here uh, revolving utilization of unsecured lines, number of times 90 days late, number of times 30 to 59 days late, and the number of times 60 to 89 days late uh, were kind of pulled out as the most important factors to predicting serious de financial delinquencies over two years. Granted, this is the most complex solution. We can jump down to say, for instance, the 11 term one, and that's gonna tell us um, the variables that uh, were important for that prediction. So again, we see revolving utilization of unsecured lines as a primary indicator of uh, potential financial delinquency. We see number of times 90 days late, number of times 60 to 89 days late, and number of times 30 to 59 days late. Let's jump back to the Enter Data tab. So what that's telling us is that variables such as age, debt ratio, monthly income, open credit lines, real estate loans, number of dependents, those actually don't matter. Granted, you know, they may end up mattering, you know, kind of secondarily, but they're not direct drivers of predicting financial delinquency. That's an incredibly valuable uh, piece of data that you get from Eureka, uh, which typically isn't available using other tools. So jumping back to view results, let's pull that up. So again, this is just a list of all the solutions. For us, the one that we kind of like is this one, which is a... Uh, it represents a good balance of complexity versus accuracy. Okay, so I've gone ahead and opened up the Report Analyze tab. Uh, there's just a couple things that I wanna show you guys before we sign off. Uh, first, you can see in front of you, I have a summary report on the models we've created. We can see the number of times the variables have occurred uh, across all the models, as well as all the unused variables. What this is telling us is, what are the primary factors in predicting financial delinquency. That's not to say that the unused variables are not important. Uh, it just means that they're probably indirect in terms of how they affect financial delinquencies or how they affect the model. So for instance, age and debt ratio, they could potentially uh, impact uh, number of dependents or be related to that. Um, so don't just discard them, but they are not uh, you know, primary factors in creating a model that predicts financial uh, delinquency. 
if we scroll down, we have a list of all the models, uh, as mentioned, uh, as well as a couple graphs that kind of indicate uh, their performance, uh, you know, observed versus predicted, uh, error versus complexity, Pareto front. Um, and we do this for every single model that's been generated. Um, you also have a couple other options which I, which I think are worth pointing out. Uh, you can evaluate models uh, or model values from a data set. So what that gives us the do or gives us the ability to do is we can pick or copy and paste um, uh, our formula or our solution into uh, this expression box and then we can evaluate it against uh, different data sets that are loaded into Eureka. So for instance, if we had uh, the test data set loaded, we could easily run the solution against the test data set and then um, see, uh, you know, compare the actual versus uh, predicted values. The last thing I wanted to show was uh, calculate model statistics on a data set. What that gives us the ability to do is basically generate a report of all the uh, error metrics for this specific data. Um, and then we can save that report uh, to our desktop so it can be shared with other people as well. So let's recap everything that we talked about today. We talked about how you can go about importing data into Eureka. We discussed how uh, you can go about preparing that data with a few different approaches. We also talked about the models that were created once we started our search. We found some solutions that were very accurate yet also very complex. We found some that were not accurate at all and coincidentally not complex at all. And then we also found solutions that were right in the sweet spot that balance accuracy and complexity uh, and that's specifically referencing that 11 term uh, solution that we found a little bit earlier. Lastly, um, just to talk a little bit about the services that we offer. So obviously we're a software development company first and foremost, um, but we also uh, do engage with uh, companies for pilots. Uh, those are typically situations where a company not only wants to use our software, but they also want to get the expertise of our data scientists. Um, we also offer a few other products. So you can see the server bullet point there. Um, I highly encourage you all to download a server version of the product and try setting up your own private cloud. It's free to try. And then lastly, um, if you would like to talk to us about OEM uh, opportunities, so for instance, embedding Eureka into your own applications, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my name's Matt Fleming again. Uh, you can reach me directly at matt.fleming at newtonian.com. Uh, if you have just a general question you'd like to talk to all of us, you can send an email to contact at newtonian.com. Thanks a lot for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.